In 480 BC, Persian King Xerxes I sought to conquer the entirety of the Greek city-states and led a large invasion force into Greek lands. About a decade earlier, his father Darius I had tried to subjugate Greece, but was unsuccessful after finally being defeated at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC. Xerxes had spent years preparing for a second attempt at conquering Greece, but his invasion was briefly checked at Thermopylae late in the summer of 480 BC. By September, a decisive naval encounter would take place in the Straits of Salamis that would determine the fate of the entire campaign. Among the Greek forces at Salamis was a dramaticist and soldier named Aeschylus. He saw military service throughout the campaign of 480 and wrote of his experiences. His responses to the Persian invasion found expression in his play Persians, the earliest of his works to survive. This play was produced in a competition in the spring of 472 BC and won first prize. Persians recounts news of the disaster when it is brought to the Persian court. Aeschylus's account is written in the perspective of the Persians during the battle. The following is a messenger's speech to the queen Atusa, mother of Xerxes. Your Majesty, it was at the appearance of some avenging fury or evil spirit that the whole tragedy began. A Greek came from the Athenian fleet to tell your son Xerxes that the Greeks would not remain when the shades of darkest night came on, but sitting on the benches of their ships, would each try independently to save his life in secret flight. Xerxes did not realize that the Greek was tricking him, nor that the gods were planning his destruction. So immediately, he heard the news. He gave orders to all his captains. When the sun's rays stopped lighting up the earth, and darkness stole over the empire of the sky, they must draw up their mass ships in three squadrons. Some must encircle Ajax's isle to guard the exit and the sea-beaten straits. In this way, if the Greeks tried to escape their fate, finding some means of flight in secret on their ships, it was sure that all power of doing so would be denied them. These were his orders in the confidence of his heart, for he did not understand the future that the gods held in store. His sailors obeyed his orders and prepared their evening meal in good discipline, while all the shipwrights fitted the blades in the shaped rowlocks. When the light of the sun vanished and night came on, each man, master of his oar, went on board, and each marine as well. Rank called to rank among the ships of the line as they sailed on their appointed course. All night long the captains kept the whole fleet moving, but when night drew to its close, nowhere had the Greeks attempted stealthily to break away. Indeed, when the white horses of day bathed all the earth in light and made things clear to see, then the strains of a hymn rang tunefully from the Greeks and the answering echo came straight back from the island cliffs. Fear came upon all the Persian fleet when they realized that they were mistaken, for the sacred hymn which the Greeks were singing did not suggest flight, but betokened men about to rush into battle with emboldened hearts. A trumpet with its bray inflamed the Greeks where they lay at anchor, and dipping at once their oars in the surf, they struck the deep brine of the sea in time. All were soon easy to see, the right wing leading the van in good order, followed by the rest, who came out after them and line astern. We could hear a great shout arise. Come, sons of Greece, free your country, free your children, your wives, the altars of your ancestral gods, free the tombs of your fathers. Our fight is now for very life itself. An answering burst of sound in the Persian tongue broke from us. Past now was the hour for holding back. Straightaway ship struck ship with brazen beak. The attack was started by a Greek ship, which sheared off the whole prow of her Phoenician foe, and others aimed their onslaught on different opponents. At first, the flood tide of the Persian fleet held its own, but when the ships became jammed and crushed in one place, they could bring no help to each other. Ships began to strike their own friends with their bronze-jawed rams and to shatter the whole bank of oars. The Greek ships, in careful plan, pressed round on us in a circle, and ships' hulls gave in. You could no longer see the water, so full of it was wrecked vessels and dead men, while the beaches and rocks were thick with corpses. Each Persian ship now rode in chaos for flight, every one of the whole invading force. The Greeks attacked and caught them up like tunny or some other fish in a net, tangled with broken oars and pieces of wreckage. A piteous cry covered the sea until sight was removed by blackest night. I could not recount in detail the whole mass of our misfortunes. No, not if I were to speak for ten whole days on end. But this you may know, that never has one day seen the death of half so many men. 
Those most naturally brave among the Persians, most courageous and most noble of birth, and most loyal to their lord, they died most horribly in a fate that is painful to tell. There is an islet near Salamis, rugged and without anchorage for ships. Here Pan walks on the seashore, the god who delights in the country dance. Xerxes sent his bravest there to kill at their ease, any members of the Greek fleet who had lost their ships and swum to land to safety. They could also save their friends from the paths of the waters. But he judged the future ill. For when the Greeks received from God the glorious victory in the naval fight, they clad their bodies in good bronze armor and leapt on shore, surrounding the islet, so that our men had nowhere to turn. Many were killed by stones hurled by hand, and arrows from the twanging bowstrings fell fast on others, dealing death. Finally, the enemy rushed forward in one surge, hacking and killing all the luckless men. There was a cry from Xerxes as he saw the depth of this calamity from the spot where he was sitting, on a high cliff at the sea's edge, visible to all the fleet. Tearing his clothes, he screamed out shrilly, bidding the land forces retreat, then fled in panicked flight himself. For this second disaster, not just the first, your tears are called. After the defeat at Salamis, Xerxes had to postpone his planned land defenses for a year, which gave the allied Greek city-states time to unite against him. In August 479 BC, the Persian land forces were decisively defeated at the Battle of Plataea, while the remnants of the naval forces were routed at the Battle of Mycale on the same day. The invasion of Greece was over.